Vaughn into the windup in his first offering. Just a bit outside. Are you crying? Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. Little roller up along first. Behind the bag. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. Are you okay? Mm. I'm fine. It just uh, threw up in my mouth a little bit. You lollygag the ball around the end. You lollygag your way down to first. You lollygag in and out of the dugout. You know what that makes you, Larry? Lollygag. Lollygag. There's chocolate all over this ball. Look, Mr. Buttermaker, quit bugging me about my food. People are always bugging me about it. My shrink says that's why I'm so fat. So you're not doing me any good, so let's quit. Well, I believe in the soul. The small of a woman's back. The hanging curveball, high fiber, good scotch, but the novels of Susan Sontag are self-indulgent, overrated crap. I believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I believe there ought to be a constitutional amendment outlawing AstroTurf and the designated hitter. I believe in the sweet spot, softcore pornography, opening your presents Christmas morning rather than Christmas Eve, and I believe in long, slow, deep, soft, wet kisses that last three days. Good night. Good night. Hi, once again, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner, the man in the arena. Ah, baseball. That perfect sport, that one that we all love, if and when they ever play again. But that's another story altogether. Because it's time to look at something that is the epitome of baseball. The fun that is baseball. And not just Major League Baseball or Minor League Baseball. A different brand of baseball. And over the years, I have been fortunate to be associated with certain people in certain places where I have enjoyed not just the game of baseball, but the people in baseball. And it only took 30, 35 years to get this interview. So I feel like I've, I've actually finally made the grade because many, 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 many moons ago, someone actually got the interview with the maniac. <laughs> It could only be the Miami Maniac, the baseball Hurricanes mascot who keeps not only the fans, but players, coaches, and umpires in stitches. His real name is John Ruth, but he and the fuzzy guy are one and the same. The Maniac, I guess, has always been a little bit a part of me, uh, the dark side of me that uh, never comes out in normal day-to-day -day routine. This is Ruth's fifth year in the mascot business, and it's a full-time job. Canes coach Ron Frazier discovered Ruth when he was a student at South Carolina and worked part-time as the Gamecocks mascot. He knows the crown, he knows how to work them, and I'd say he adds a tremendous amount, uh, you know, to the to the fans, the kids, they love to see him, the adults just as much as the kids. And, and to those who don't know him, John likes to keep it that way. In fact, he preferred we not show what he looks like out of costume. I'd like to meet as many people as possible, but, but it, it adds a little bit of mystery to the uh, character. You know, if, if everybody knows what the guy inside the maniac looks like, uh, then it, you know, it's, it's just a person inside of it. And this way, they know somebody's in it, but they don't know who it is, and that kind of adds a little bit of fun to it. This guy is such a completely split personality. Out there on the field, in that outfit, he gets away with stuff that out on the street, he could never get away with. In fact, he'd probably be arrested for most of it. <laughs> Don has uh, actually become a lot more uh, timid in, in normal life because of the maniac, because I'm allowed to come out every night and be as crazy as I want to and do whatever I want to uh, within certain moral standards. And uh, it's really uh, kind of calmed the, the real John down. This all looks like a lot of fun, and it is, but it's also hard work. For example, it isn't easy to be funny every night. You know, there's some nights, I'm like everybody else, that I'll come to the park and just not want to put the suit on. But I have to make myself get into the frame of mind that, hey, it's the maniac uh, that's going to be the one that's funny tonight. Word, 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 word. Eyes. Eyes. Witness. Witness. I have to love the... the the abuse and the sweat, and, but it's, you know, it's always so much fun. And the little kids, you know, come up to you and, you know, hug you, and that, that makes it all worthwhile. I had the fortune for several years to be the radio voice of the University of Miami Hurricanes baseball team. And I spent a lot of time around Mark Light Stadium, 
Yeah, that's right. It's still Mark Light, okay? That's it. It doesn't count for anything else. I'm not calling it by any other name, damn it. It's still Mark Light, and that's what those of us who've been to the ballpark for a long time actually know it as. That's it. Game over. Okay, show's over. No, just kidding. Lots of time spent there. Lots of time getting to know my guest. In and out of costume. Even though I never interviewed the guy. We should have had him on the radio. Well, but, okay, but he couldn't talk, so Christ, that pretty much took everything out. Without further ado... To all my friends at the University of Miami and around the country, ladies and gentlemen, no longer in witness protection after all these years, John Ruth joins us on the show. Big John, thank you so much for, thank you for gracing me with this interview. It took so long, John. So long. <laughs> Ed, I promised it wasn't uh, on purpose. I was, I was contracted. I couldn't do it. No, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Happy to be here. I, you know, after all the the time and all the interviews that I've done, I was thinking to myself one night. You know, I there's one guy who deserves an interview for all that you've done, because you and we're going to talk about some others as well are a constant. I mean, even though you're not in the costume anymore, it's the costume that you made popular that you created and you you created so much fun that i said we, we got to give you the chance and people actually a chance to get to know a little bit more about you which is why when you said in that interview with frank fort another great friend that the maniac brings out the dark side in me i i, I don't know why but i just can't see you you wearing a darth vader hat at, at that point and breathing <laughs> you will come to me and i will be your baseball god what dark side, John? <laughs> well, I mean, not necessarily dark as in oh, okay. evil, but uh, you know, you're you're allowed to do, you know, like I, I wouldn't walk up to some co-ed on campus and just grab her and bend her over and give her a kiss. The maniac could, uh, you know, those those type things that that uh, within, you know, as as in the story it said within certain moral standards. You know, Coach Frazier, uh, Ron Frazier, was just an amazing person to to be a mentor. And he wanted good, clean, G-rated family entertainment. And so that was, uh, you know, what we gave most of the time. There were a couple of times where we might have gone just a little bit over the line. But, uh, you know, that was the thing. It was just such a great time to be uh, at the light. As you mentioned, it will always be the light to me as well. Uh, and it was just a great ballpark with j -Row announcing, the Maniac running around, the promotions, the giveaways, and the baseball team was winning. It was just a just mm. an awesome uh, convergence of, of the planets and the stars. To It was just an amazing time, and, and I was fortunate enough to be able to, to kind of, uh, you know, so, someone said uh, that it was a three-ring circus with Coach Frazier <laughs> leading it, and I, I was in one of those rings somewhere, you know, doing uh, my thing as the Maniacs. Well, let, let, let's get to that then, because there's so many things we have to talk about, and, and we've got, for those of you watching us on our video show, you'll get to see the pictures that we're talking about. For those of you listening on our audio podcast, I heartily recommend you go to welcometothearena.com on the YouTube page, and you'll be able to see a lot of these pictures we'll be talking about a little bit later on. But when we talk about that inception, I've never, I mean, I've, look, I've heard the the stories that are out there about how you were at South Carolina, Coach Frazier found you, but those are all public. What's the real story here? I mean, what was that, what were the phone calls like, the negotiations, the, the, the Frazier and Rick Remmert arm that, that got put on you and said, come on, kid, you're coming to the University of Miami. Come on. What was all that like? Well, as you mentioned, I, I actually graduated from South Carolina and my last uh, two, my first, my, my, my first senior year and my second senior year might be the better way to put it. <laughs> uh, I was kind of the best man. Uh, I, and and I, I could have graduated after the first senior year, but the football team was going to Hawaii. So I thought, Okay, I'll stretch it to a year and a half, two years, and Mark Man. you know, go to Hawaii. But uh, so I was fortunate enough that in the '81 and yes, long time ago, the 1981 season, uh, Jerry Miles, who was the director of NCAA championships, came to Columbia for the South Carolina regional in May, and so he saw how I performed. So South Carolina ended up winning the regional. And Jerry said to Coach Reigns, well, why don't you bring that mascot? He's pretty entertaining. Bring him and there he Omaha. is. For those people watching right now, there it is. That's the night that, and that is cocky. The, that is the, cocky. And he, he is original, wearing the, was, the 1982 College World Series shirt there. So that's your time in Omaha. Right. Well, so in 81, I just worked the four South Carolina games. And then when South Carolina was eliminated, came home. In 82, 
Um, uh, Miami actually came to Columbia in April of 82 and per, uh, had a four game series. And so they saw how I worked and Rick Remmert, as you mentioned, was coach Frazier's marketing director. He was tasked with the job of getting me to Miami for an audition. Of course, I wanted to spend more time with the back girls who came up with the team than with Rick. And so I avoided him the entire weekend until Sunday afternoon's game in Columbia was, was rained out in the, in the seventh inning. I go up to the press box and the only seat available is next to this guy who turns and says, hi, I'm Rick Remmer. I need to get you to Miami. <laughs> so we worked it out to where uh, actually that photo right there of, of cocky uh, is 40 years ago. Uh, my last game at, at South Carolina for basketball, but then we started doing baseball as cocky. Um, but so I ended up coming down, rearranging my exam schedule in May of 82 and coming down for the Florida state series, which was May 7th through the 9th. It was kind of an, an audition as the maniac prior to that. And, and as you mentioned, uh, they had seen cocky work in 81 and Basically, the story I heard was that Coach Frazier said, well, if South Carolina can have a mascot with all the promotions we do, why don't we have a mascot? So they created the character. Uh, the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce actually donated the money for the costume. And it was designed by one of our big fans, Jeff Werner, uh, who was a big Philly fanatic fan, Philly fan. And uh, so the, that's why the maniac character has a snout, had the big belly and the big feet, very similar to the fanatic. So, uh, so move forward to the 82 season and they had a couple of students do it. Uh, they had apparently equipment manager who uh, got fired after about an inning and a half of <laughs> just harassing Reds. Uh, so when I came in in May, the character had really not done anything. It had just been kind of a, as I like to call it, a Disney character, shook hands, took pictures, was there. Uh, and suddenly because of what I did at South Carolina and the free reign that I had to, to uh, run around on, on the field and do whatever I wanted to, uh, Coach Frazier gave me that same freedom here. So I come down for the Florida State Series, and I'm out on the field pregame, and I'm playing, messing around with players and umpires. And it took a couple of innings for the crowd to kind of go, wait, wait a minute, the maniac's different tonight. Who, what's in that? Who's in that? You know. And so, so that was kind of my audition. Fast forward a, a month after I had my graduation at South Carolina, uh, South Carolina wins the regional again. So I go out to Omaha, and prior to the first game, Coach Frazier, Coach Reigns got together, convinced the, the NCAA to make Cocky the official mascot for the series. So that's why the picture you showed earlier has Cocky wearing an 82 uh, jersey that was made. Actually, Jerry Miles' wife put together that with two extra large T-shirts that they were selling <laughs> at the concession stand. And so Cocky became the official mascot for the College World Series in 1982. South Carolina, unfortunately, was eliminated two games. Well, I'd already met some of the Miami guys in May, so I started hanging around with them. And Miami went on to win the College World Series in 1982. Yeah. Uh, so I you know, enjoyed the celebration because they were kind of like my new adopted team. So over the, the summer, uh, I actually created a character called the Carolina Chickadee, and I performed uh, some a couple of minor league games. I did a, a, a Dixie baseball tournament in Nacogdoches, Texas, of all places. Uh, and so I was still, I still kind of had the mascot bug and Miami reached out to me in early fall of, of 82 and said, would you be interested in coming and being the maniac for the 83 season? Uh, and so I thought, yeah, you know, six months in Miami, why not? And 35 years later, or however many it is, 40 years later, I'm still here. Uh, because it was just such a, it, it was, a, it was just a fun life being able to be a mascot. I was not working, uh, you know, a nine to five job. I could sleep late, uh, you know, come to the ballpark. Hang well, yeah, out but don't talk, talk about that for a second though. I mean, not everybody want, it's not as if it's written on a job application. What would you like to be? Engineer, <laughs> lawyer, doctor, mascot, man who dresses around and walks around in a big fuzzy suit all night long. So I, I, I get that it started at South Carolina. But it would seem to me that it was almost like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot and I'll do it. Nobody, nobody tries. Well, but wait a minute. I'm going to say nobody tries to become a mascot. But back in those days, that was the days of the San Diego chicken. And Ted Giannoulis was making a huge dollar as, as a mascot at that point. So what, was, yeah. was that any sort of push for you or it just kind of happened? Well, I think, I think more, it just kind of happened. I mean, you know, uh, think about it. It was really prior to, I mean, ESPN was just getting started, you know, back then. 
you would see the chicken a little snippet here and there. So it wasn't like, you know, he was some kind of an idol that I wanted to become him. It was just, I thought it was something fun to do. Uh, you know, I mean, really getting started in South Carolina, it was only because a couple of fraternity brothers were cheerleaders and said, I, I was the weird guy at the fraternity party. I'll admit it. Uh, you know, we'd have a cowboy. Well, look, Indian look, you got to be the weird guy at the fraternity party to wear this costume in the first place and be on the top of a human <laughs> pyramid for crying out loud, John. I mean, OK, but you were a younger guy then, so you could handle it. <laughs> you, well, you know, I, we, we'd have a Cowboys and Indians mixer and I'd come as a Cleveland baseball player and people would be going, Cleveland baseball. I'm like, Indian, <laughs> you know, people wouldn't quite get. But I got it. So I, I was kind of kind of a little off, I guess you could say. So I was able to, you know, make cocky uh, into a, a living, breathing character. And and uh, so I thought, you know, it, it just sounded like fun. Come to Miami for six months. And, um, you know, actually, I had a friend several years later, many years later, I was interviewed by the Miami Hurricane newspaper on the phone. And uh, I was at my house and a friend was there, my buddy Joe. And, and the girl said, describe your job in 10 words or less. And I looked at Joe and I said, describe my job in 10 words or less. And he picks up the other extension and he goes, he dresses in carpet and acts like an imbecile. <laughs> that kind of uh, described a lot of it. You just get in this costume. You just do crazy stuff. And, and I also looked at it as if I was having fun, everybody around me was going to have fun. Um, you know, and as I say, we, we did it within certain parameters. So I wasn't going to cross the line. And well, wait, well, what, what about those parameters? Because, I mean, for instance, here is a great picture of you with, uh, it looks like young ladies from Team USA. And you are, of course, the center of attention. Every man wants to be you at that point. But, you know, you got, as you pointed out earlier, you were able to do some things on the field that you would not be able to do even back in the 80s that you really couldn't do on the street. I mean, God forbid you try to do it now. I mean, you'd be spending time in a Russian prison. I mean, at, 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 at this <laughs> level, the way things are going. But what was that line? And how did you get to that line? And how much of that line was drawn by Frazier and Rick when they decided to do all this? Well, I don't know if we ever actually drew the line. <laughs> you know, there, really were, there were no rules back then. You know, now mascots are limited by, you know, what the conference says or the team says. Or Back then, we, we just kind of made up the rules as we went along. Uh, you know, we did things. And, and as I say, it was always in the back of my mind, a good, clean, G-rated family entertainment. So, you know, the picture there with the Sensations, they were their dance group here at the University of Miami and uh, you know, I knew most of those girls from just being around campus and some of them dated football players or baseball players. So, you know, I might have, you know, taken a picture with them and put my arms around them, but I wasn't, you know, going to do anything uh, that could get me, you know, a weekend in, in the lockup. Um, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't so get you in trouble was, if the guys go, hey, come on, John. <laughs> It's my girlfriend, man. Yeah, it's my girlfriend. What are you doing, dude? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mean, and, and I guess, you know, my upbringing, my parents, uh, you know, one of the last things my mother told me was don't be a jerk because um, we'd heard stories about the chicken being a jerk. Uh, so, True. you know, I always wanted to, uh, to, 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 I just, you know, it's my personality. You're, the cos In the costume, your personality comes out threefold, tenfold. And I like to think that I was just a nice person kid person. And so I was doing things that would be funny, but I wasn't going to, you know, make anybody, I wasn't trying to embarrass anybody. I wasn't trying to, uh, you know, make them look like a fool. It, really the maniac was the fool. The maniac was kind of a lovable loser character. And so he might have, you know, put his arm around the girl in the stands, but you know, at the end of the night, the ball player's going home with the pretty girl, you know? So it was kind of that mentality of, you know, the maniac's not going home with the girl, sadly. Uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, and of course, this wonderful picture here of uh, the one maniac's of my favorites. Uh, Dolly Parton routine. Um, that was back when Dolly was very popular and the song Nine to Five was played. That's uh, Chip Baker, the third base coach at the time for the Florida State Seminoles. He had just gotten engaged and it had been publicly announced. And uh, so the maniac, of course, had to give him a slight bachelor's party there. But on the field, and it was in semi-good, clean taste. Well, but see, that's it. I mean, you did it with other players, too. And when you were at the, the College World Series, I mean, you had so many other players that you were involved in from other teams. And I think what always impressed me was, at least from what we could see from the outside looking in, 
is that the opposing coaches, the umpires, the players, they seem to get along. They seem to, I mean, certainly you let them know what you were going to do sometimes and they were in on the act. But were most people um, amenable to you having fun with them on the field? I, I can't imagine that everybody was. Yeah, most of them were. Um, I mean, there are very few times that they, certainly they may not have done something on the field, you know, like slapping the maniac or whatever, because they knew, you know, they might have said something when they got back to the to the the dugout. But most te- people were very uh, cooperative, uh, especially even Mike Martin, you know, Miami's uh, oh, yeah. arch rival, Florida State head coach. Mike Martin was kind of like, yeah, boy, you want to come in here and come to town where uh, uh, I did one routine one year where um, the maniac has actually dropped in in a helicopter. He's got fatigues on and uh, there's smoke blowing across the field and the maniac crawls his way towards the third base dugout and tosses a toy grenade into the, the dugout and 15 or 20 Florida state players come falling out of the dugout and a couple of them come up with water guns and the maniac jumps up and shoots them down. And as I like to say, just like John Wayne, you know, and, so there's players to spread out all over the field. And a lot of those guys were in the, the lineup, you know, because they wanted to participate as well. They wanted to have fun. You know, a lot of times they'd come down, they'd see the Miami guys. We always made the freshmen in particular uh, do routines with the maniac. Of course. And so they saw it was fun. And so they wanted to participate. The umpires, we had a great group of umpires, both at the light but then also in, at College World Series, the Maniac became the official mascot for the World Ser- College World Series in Omaha from uh, 1983, the first year, until uh, 1991. Uh, that's a wonderful picture with Dick Zivic, who was a great umpire from uh, Michigan. And, you know, they were doing, Maniac and Dick are doing dueling banjos on the field, and the crowd just loved it. And the umpires loved it, too, because they're out there for two weeks, and they're, you know, even though they know they're, 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 you know, calling the game, they can get a little bored at, a, you know, being in the same place for two weeks and calling baseball games for two weeks. So they enjoyed, uh, you know, getting along with it. The, the, the greatest thing I ever did, although you mentioned, did someone not like it? Yes, there were a couple of people with the NCAA who over the years, uh, you know, would, would give me a hard time about, well, don't, you know, you can't, you, you can't use the players unless you get permission in advance. Then it became, the greatest thing I ever did in, in Omaha, 1988, the national championship game, back when they had a, a one game Saturday at noon national championship game. Mm, uh, the good and old days. I, I, the good old days. Yeah. You would, you know, but, uh, although I kind of like the, the, the best out of three series now, but, yeah. but it came down to where I got the umpires to come and do the hokey pokey with the maniac at the end of the seventh inning. I mean, this is late in the game. There had been, and even been a close play at, at the plate prior to uh, the, you know, the, the inning ending. And, but the umpires all came, all six of them, because they would have two down the, the lines as well, and did the hokey pokey with the Miami Maniac on the third baseline at the College World Series. Brent Musburger was doing the game for CBS, and they came back from commercial, and he's like, oh, Maniac, look at this. You know, the, these are some umpires that really know what it's all about. And, but unfortunately, the NCAA people didn't view it as as much fun. So the next year it was, okay, Maniac, you can't use the umpires this year. And so, you know, there are, there were, were always some, some sticklers in the mud. Uh, but, but in general, most people wanted to participate. They want to be part of the show. Yeah. It makes you think because uh, again, at, at that point, you're talking about how the NCAA had a problem. Don't mess with the umpires. Be careful with the players. And you talked about that instance where you had, and I remember the bit where you came in with the toy hand grenade and throwing it into the dugout. That's the change, though, John. That was in the 80s. You could not come close to doing that today. <laughs> it's almost as if, unfortunately, half of the Maniac's catalog, which is legendary, you couldn't do it today because people are so, are, are so touchy in so many ways. And it would seem to me that now would not be a great time to be a mascot because you just can't have that kind of unfettered fun that you had back then because people are much too sensitive these days. No doubt. I mean, you know, as I say, we got away with a lot of stuff, but it wasn't, 
it, in today's, you're right, in today's um, atmosphere. And, and in today's it, it social would, you know, social media and the way things are in today's atmosphere. Right, yeah, you, I mean, right, especially right. now you consider as we're taping this, that the world is at war. So yeah. you know, to come out and do anything like that would be difficult. And yeah, I mean, but I mean, it, it really I sound like the guy, like, I'm get off my lawn kind of guy. But it was a more innocent time when you could get away with a lot of this stuff. And I imagine that's really what made it so much fun is you could let your imagination roll into a million different things. And oh, yeah. God love him, Frazier let you get away with almost anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what I say. There really were no rules. And we got a, we, we did a lot of things that, that you're right, we couldn't do today. I mean, one of them, you know, the only time I really remember somebody giving Coach a hard time was, uh, you know, the and, and – while the chicken may have made this routine famous, I had actually done this at South Carolina as cocky before I'd ever seen the chicken perform this routine. Um, but I came out dressed as a doctor and, you know, with the eye chart. I mean, everybody does that to the umpire. You know, that's the first thing you think of as a mascot. You got umpires, they're blind. So I had done this previously. But so I changed up the routine. And instead of just stopping with the eye chart and the umpire could see, I had a Playboy. <laughs> and one of those I remember that bit. Magazine. But the girl was turned to the side, and I got white athletic tape from our wonderful trainer, Vinny Scavo, and just put huge X's. I mean, you basically could see the girl from the neck up. And as I flipped that out, then the umpire goes crazy. Yes, I can see, and the crowd goes crazy and wonderful. And it, so it was just a quick, you know, pull out the thing, boom, and then off the field. And you remember, this is now at home plate. So this is a good 120 feet from the, you know, anybody who can really see. But come Monday morning, Coach Frazier comes into the Heck Center uh, here at the athletic department when the baseball office was still in the, the athletic department offices. And there's a woman sitting on a chair in the lobby with her Bible. And she says, are you Coach Frazier? And he goes, yes, ma'am, what, what can I help you with? And she starts reading scripture. And coach goes, what, what, ma'am, what, what can I thank you, but what can I help you with? And she says, you know, the maniac on Saturday night had a playboy. And I had my child there. And, the, you know, I had to explain to my child what the playboy was. And, <sighs> and you know, so coach, of course, calls me in. You know, he, he tried to persuade her that it was not a serious thing. And, and, and she left. Coach called me in and. And in his wonderful way, said, so, John, did the crowd like it? And I went, yeah, Coach, the crowd went crazy. He goes, why don't you do it Friday night? Let's have some more fun with See, it. You know? That's <laughs> the Frazier that we knew right there. That's him. Yes. If the crowd <laughs> loved it, do it. And, you know, there were some routines that I did that bombed. And so, it was, you know, hit Coach would go, all right, John, that, that's the last time you do that one. You know, uh, I remember one in particular when break dancing, <laughs> you know, when you had the kids break dancing. And I thought, oh. Wouldn't it be funny if the maniac came out with bricks on a string and we had J-Row announce, ladies and gentlemen, the maniac is doing brick dancing. <laughs> and I'm standing here with these bricks and the crowd is just looking and staring, just going, what in the world? Coach Frazier, I come in, walking in the dugout. He goes, you're not going to do that one again, are you? No, Coach. That, that was <laughs> you know, but Coach, that was the attitude of, of if it was funny and if, you know, it, we didn't want to, like I said, we didn't want to offend anyone. And and back in those days, you had to really go a long way to offend someone. So you're right. It would be tough to do things like that now. I mean, because simply just by pulling out the, the, the Playboy magazine today, it would be demeaning. Well, you, you couldn't do it because, so first of all, there's no Playboy magazine. You'd have to come out with a laptop and you'd have to, you'd have, you'd have to show it like that. And this or, is or a, an actual real female, but, but which, yeah, no, which wouldn't work either. Uh, not in this day and age. Yeah, I, I want to take a minute because it's a perfect time to talk about coach because I, I, I wanted to make sure we did because the people who go back to those years when Ron Frazier was the coach and remember him, we all have such amazing, wonderful, warm memories of this man because I mean, I know that, you know, he changed college baseball. End of story. He, Rick Remmert working with him, you, J. Rowe, who we'll talk about in a little bit, and other people, you guys changed college baseball and made it something special. 
But Ron was a guy, I mean, I was a wet behind the ears play-by-play announcer for a radio station that was desperate to get football. And they said, let's get the baseball contract and we'll convince them to give us the football, which never happened. It was a ridiculous plan because they wouldn't pay the UM enough money for the football. That's another story altogether, which I can get into. But I loved it. It was the two, it was two of the best years of my broadcast career. And Frazier was a guy who would call me aside when he heard something on the air and he would, he would give me chops. He would talk to me about it. He never admonished me. He used to tell me little stories and all this. I mean, God, I, the man was, was such an, an, an amazing human being that he changed my life. He changed your life. And, and I, someday people are going to realize that more than ever before about what a marvelous man he was and how many lives he really changed. No doubt. I've, I've said it before. He's the George Bailey of college baseball. He changed so many people, you know, he touched so many lives and changed so many lives. Uh, you know, he, he used to always joke with me, where would you be? What would you be doing in South Carolina if I hadn't brought you down here? I mean, coach, I have no clue. I'd probably be in jail. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, you know, he, he saw a talent in me and, and wanted to make that talent. I mean, certainly he wanted to help his program. He, he wanted to, to help his fans be entertained. But he saw the talent in me and helped me grow with it. He, he would help me. The, the, the idea really when, when I came down was I'd be here one, two, maybe three years and hook on with a major league team or maybe a triple-A club or something. And Coach helped me do that. You know, he was willing to help me leave by set, helping me set up minor league appearances during the summers of 84, 85, 86. 86, he took me to the World Baseball Championships in Holland. He arranged with Bowie Kuhn for me to be, to, to, for the maniac to go over there and perform. So while he was helping himself, he was helping me in my career tremendously. I mean, just what a wonderful mentor that is, that it's someone, you know, who was who willing to, you know, not force me to continue to work for him, but he was trying to help me. As it turned out, I never wanted to leave because I was having such fun and, and I truly just, it, this was home. I mean, he was a second father to me. Um, and, and it was just wonderful that, you know, and, and he treated us all like, you know, he had three girls and so we were all his boys and, and oh, I mean, yeah. he really treated us like sons and, and took care of us. And, and, you know, to this day, you know, it, it, I mean, whenever his name comes up, it's just a warm feeling inside because he was just, while he was a wonderful baseball coach and a wonderful marketer, he was just a wonderful person. And you, you mentioned his daughters, whom I still stay in touch with to this day. You do as well. A lot of us do from the UM family and who are just the loveliest women on the face of the earth and wonderful people. But he also came with a marvelous family. And that's why this picture, the people who are watching, uh, I want you to talk about because this is the kind of guy Frazier was. And all of his family adopted all of us and brought us all in. No doubt. I mean, his, his, this is his wife, second wife, Karen, uh, Leanne, the first wife, they, you know, they were just as close. They were all just wonderful people. The picture you're showing was, was when coach went into the college baseball hall of fame in 2006 in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, I'm kind of a pack rat. I never throw anything away. But to, <laughs> I know, John, I've been to the Hall of Fame before. I've seen what it's like with you there, brother. <laughs> I've got stuff everywhere. But but so I, I, I wanted to show my appreciation, my love for him. And so I took a, a, a suitcase full of memorabilia and made what I called it. I put a little note on the door, Ron Frazier Museum West. And uh, so out in Lubbock, Texas, I, I created this little shrine to coach Frazier. And, and we had some of the other inductees, uh, uh, Will Clark and uh, Dave Winfield and all uh, They actually came by the room to take a look at the shrine that I built for coach. It was just up for 24 hours in my hotel room. But I mean, that was something that he, he was, he and his family. I mean, they all treated us as if we were family members. Yes. You're right. To this day, I still go to the games with uh, his daughter, Liz and her husband, Peter and uh, Cynthia comes to games and, uh, Linda's coming down. Uh, she lives up in Orlando, but oh, I mean, they they come they come to UM baseball games and and are treated you know as you know even though it's still it's thirty years since coach coached at Miami uh, they are still the first family of of Hurricane baseball. Yeah, and I'm gonna yeah, 
I have to tell you something, and this has become almost a, a cause celeb for me. And I'm between COVID and a lot of other things that have happened, it has sort of fallen off the table. And I'm not going to ask you, you don't have to opine if you don't want to. It's okay, but I want this on the record so everybody knows I, I, I'm in this. I want that ballpark renamed. I want that ballpark to be Ron Frazier Field at Mark Light Stadium. End of story. No matter who you want involved, it's okay, and I'm not going to try and create a controversy here. I'll do that when you're not here. But his name should be all over. The statue outside the ballpark is wonderful, but his name should be everywhere. Because if it wasn't for him, there'd be no baseball at Miami. There, 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 there may never have been a program when we had athletic directors there who didn't like baseball and who basically ran roughshod over it. He kept that program alive and then followed by guys like Jerry Weinstein and, and so many others who were in there who kept it alive. But Frazier needs to be... John, Fra Fraze just needs to be memorialized a whole lot more than he is. So that's... See, I, I, I will agree with that last sentiment. I'm not getting into the contract. Please don't. Things, no, but, please don't. It's okay. Um, no, you're right. He, he, you know, a lot of people don't know that we dropped basketball for 15 years. Yeah. In, in 1971 was, you know, we went on a hiatus. We were going to drop football in the late seventies and it was coach Frazier with coach Stellenberger who got together and convinced two board of trustee members to change their votes or Miami would have dropped football. And coach Frazier knew that had they dropped football, baseball was next. So, I mean, imagine a world where there's no Miami football, no Miami baseball, no Miami basketball, no Miami athletics, period. And, um, and we can Frazier all go back to really a time when there were certain people atop the hierarchy of the University of Miami who looked at athletics and they kind of yeah. gave, it, gave it the high nose. We don't want to be a sports yeah. university. We want to be the Harvard of the South. Yeah. And a lot of us remember those years. The, Those yeah. were difficult no, you're years. Right. I mean, we, no doubt we, but without Coach Frazier's influence and, you know, and, and after his passing, you know, Howard Schnellenberger said, you know, they, they were, I wouldn't say they were adversaries, but they were competing for attention at the sure. same time. And, well, you had two and, guys with big coach, egos. I mean, I love both of them yeah, to death and yeah. God, God rest both their souls. But Howard and Ron had huge, massive egos, but they earned them. Yeah, yeah. yeah but Howard said, Howard said he, when he came here as the head coach, he looked at what Ron did with baseball. And he said, if I can get the fans out. And, and I mean, they apparently they did get together and, and discussed it. Sure they and did. so, you know, that shows you the importance of, of, you know, Ron Frazier, you know, like I say, not only saved the football program, but he helped Howard build it. Uh, he, he certainly built the – baseball program from scratch. And, uh, you know, and like I say, where would I be without Ron Frazier, the George I mean, Bailey? Where would a lot of us be? I mean, because Fraze, you know, coach gave me so much great advice over the years and he was just so wonderful to be around. I, I miss him terribly every day. Ron Frazier Field at Mark Light Stadium. I'm going to get back on my high horse again and I'm going to start ticking people off. I wrote a letter some time ago. I wrote a letter about this to certain people in the hierarchy at the University of Miami. And I got a phone call from somebody, I'm not going to get into it here, and said, you need to shut up. That was exact words. You need to shut up. I said, no, we'll take that another phase. That'll be, that'll be another day, one of these days. But I want to get back. There's two people I want to make sure that, that, uh, uh, that we mention here. Um, you, you mentioned his name earlier, and I want to make sure that we, we talk about him a little bit. Uh, Jay Rokich, who is as much a legendary part of this program as anybody who has been that announcing voice that was there when I first walked into the press box and Kenny Lee and I used to knock around and make jokes and Jay Ro was there and have fun with. It was people, I got to tell you, working even in the media, I would go down to the UM games just to go sit in the press box and be around these people who still to this day are my friends and wonderful people. But J. Rowe was part of the act, and he was part of the, of the maniac and part of what made it special, correct? No doubt. I mean, there would be many a night where, you know, a routine would fail and J. Rowe would Mr. <laughs> maniac, and he'd make some kind of a comment, and the maniac would 
threw the belly at him or, you know, we, 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 we worked very well together. I mean, and it was, it was, we both kind of had this sixth sense of knowing what we, each other was thinking. And so he would make a comment, the maniac would react or the, you know, the maniac would purposely do something and j Row would react. Um, but his voice, you know, it's amazing. That, uh, there have been major league ball players who've come back. He's amazing. Go, Man, when I was in college, that guy announced me. You know, I mean, he is a, a recognizable voice. And, and a lot of it, too, th- thanks to the, the 80s when, uh, you know, ESPN was doing college baseball games. Well, Miami was the hot team back then. And so every Sunday night, it seemed like maybe it was five or six times, you know, during the, the, the spring, ESPN would come to a Sunday night baseball game at Mark Light. And so Jay's voice was heard around the country, uh, you know, via those games. And so he, he was 54 years. I believe this is his 54th season. Uh, the, 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 the names he remembers, the players he remembers, you know, it's, it, it's amazing, but, but he and I, yeah, if it wasn't for him and, you know, helping the maniac, because, you know, there, there were times where, you know, where, where if he might have been sick, which was rare, or if he had a, a, an appearance or something. Gabriel's never been sick. Of, what are we, are you serious? I, no, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but when someone else was, was behind the microphone, it was just totally different. And it, and it is. The ballpark is just totally different when you don't hear his voice. You know, when you hear that voice, you know you're coming in the Mark Light Stadium and it's Jay Rokich uh, on the announcing and it's Hurricane Baseball and, you know, so he, he and he's spread out. He's done a lot of events here for, you know, the Hall of Fame. He does, you know, all kinds of things around the community. He does Jimmy Johnson's fishing tournament. Uh, and, you know, so he's he's very active in the community and, and just, you know, he's he's a one of kind. That that voice, you know. We love him. Hopefully yes, we'll he's be in Mark Light for many, many years to come. I haven't seen him in a long time because of COVID and everything else. And uh, Joey Nelson and I, I keep in touch with him. And uh, I'm going to get down to the ballpark one day soon and hopefully see a, uh, a game this season. Which, which then brings me to, before I get to, um, I, I, God, there's so much that, that, that we could do here. But I want to make sure we, we get a, a lot of this in here. You, you talked about the team. And these were the guys that were in the era that I was there. And, I mean, here's a picture that... That is up, and I'm I'm looking at this picture when I first saw it, and I'm going, okay, how many guys can I can I recognize? And I saw, that's Joe Nelson in the back trying to have a muscle in his and trying to flex. <laughs> Joey, when you watch this, you you never had any muscles, dude. It's okay, you you, you still don't. You 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 were not the muscular guy. You got to leave that to Mandel. You know he he had all the, but this picture I think captures beautifully what it was between the Miami Maniac and the players. There was a bond with these young men, and I was fortunate enough to be part of it on a couple of World Series trips. That's where Joe and I got to be very good friends and some of the other players. But you don't see this that much, John. It's just yeah, that was such not a even different today. time, Ed. You're right. It was, you know, now the ball, ball players are more serious. They, you know, because the, most of these guys play football, basketball, baseball. They, they specialized on, in baseball, but growing up, they, they did everything. So they were more well-rounded. And, and I'm, I'm again, I, I don't want us to be the get off my long guy either. But, you know, nowadays the kids May start well. playing baseball at age <laughs> eight, and that's all they do. And these guys were just a fun bunch to be around. Uh, this is, you know, the 85 team in particular that won the national championship. We, could, we would get together at the drop of a hat still to this day, you know, 40, almost 40 years later, uh, because we were just, we, we had a great time and yes, winning obviously makes solidified that final bond, but, uh, it was just a great group of guys. And, and, uh, you know, again, that's a, that's a kind of a time that will never be again because it was so innocent, but that's, you know, and that's we were still, even though we, we need to kind of push that forward a little bit because that was an innocent time when we talk about baseball and the way it's become today. It has, even for college guys, it has become such a business that a lot of this camaraderie right. seems to be missing. Now, again, we're not involved. We don't go to every franchise. We don't go to every university. We don't know every team. But, John, I just don't get that feeling of, wow, I don't get that feeling of fun anymore. And and I, yeah, I, mean, and, kids, and I don't know why. Kids, like I say, they, they start at age eight and their parents are pushing them because the parents oh, are, God. you know, I mean, you know, my, my dad, right. 
as I recall, it maybe came to one out of every three little league games that I went to, you know, it was a different time. And it wasn't that he didn't love me or didn't think I was a good <laughs> athlete, which I really wasn't that great. He was a weird kid. Um, he walked around with something on his head all the time. He had fuzzy <laughs> gloves on all the time. Well, I, I will. It popped into my head. I do remember somebody asked me, why were you a good mascot one time? And I said, well, because I wasn't good at any sport, but I was good enough that I could play all sports. So when I'm on the sidelines at a football game, I know what's going on in the field so I can react to it. Same thing with baseball, basketball, you know. And but again, going back to the, to the kids these days, they focus on baseball starting at such a young age and they're pushed to be a major leaguer when only, you know, one tenth of one percent or, you know, from the age of eight are actually going to make major league baseball. Don't check my math on that. I don't know, don't know the exact numbers. Yeah, that's right. We're not, not doing a math show here. Both of us would fail miserably. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, you know, they're pushed to that. And so it is, it's, it's serious. It's become a business. They, Oh my God, I've got to make the major leagues. I've got to get a college scholarship. And, you know, back in the old days, guys played, like I say, they played three sports and if somebody offered them a football scholarship, they take it. If they offered them a baseball scholarship, they take it. It was a lot, it was a lot different, you know, back then. One of the guys, that and I want you to tell me a story that you've never told before. I want you to I want you to think, yeah, okay, because someone else who, who sometimes doesn't get a lot of the, the attention. We mentioned Rick Remmert and the brilliant job that he did in the marketing department and helping this program along and helping UM along and baseball along. Ron Frazier, the assistant coaches, the players, but one of the first guys to give me grief when I was there, fun grief, was a guy named Vinny Scavo. The um, <laughs> the trainer who was who to this day is one of the nicest human beings, one of the best guys in the world. He's the kind of guy who would give you the shirt off his back, but boy, he needled me every now and then when he got a chance, and I I loved it. He was he was one of the he was one of the fun guys to be around that doesn't get a lot of attention, but he he should because that's part of the family. Vinny Scavo saved my life. Uh, he saved Rick There's Remmert's a story. Life. Okay, tell that. He has saved many people's lives. Well, I mean, he, he uh, Vinny is currently the head trainer here at the University of Miami. Uh, after many years of, you know, bouncing around, uh, I mean, he was here in the, mostly the '80s, early '90s. Got with uh, the Marlins for a while, uh, and you know, but got, came back here ten years ago, or whatever, and and is now the head trainer. Um, the nineteen eighty five College World Series. Uh, he was rooming with Rick Remmert, the marketing guy we've been talking about. Rick slipped. I hope I'm not telling the story out of tail, but most people uh, around the program. Oh, go ahead. We're all old at this point, damn it. Nobody cares. Go ahead. But he <laughs> he cut his wrist very seriously, he slipped and, and hit his razor. And Vinny literally saved his life, stopped the bleeding, got him to the hospital. So then what does Vinny do? Well, he takes the bloody towel and before the game that night, throws it out in front of the Miami dugout and says, look at us, we're bleeding and we don't care. We're still going to kick your butts. <laughs> so, uh, you know. But Vinny, he was Vinny, Kurt Schilling he before he knew it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, but he, several years ago, he talked to me. I was having some some you know physical problems, and he, he says, you're going to the hospital right now. He got me over to the hospital, got me in. Turns out I ended, needed two stents in my heart and, oh, wow. you know, literally could have uh, – could would not be here perhaps today if, if but Vinny's just he, he saved players lives on the field he just he, he literally is a, a, a lifesaver and uh, but just a great guy uh, he was my roommate for the first uh, year or so at, at, but I, there's some stories I just can't tell uh, but well I mean it seems was, like in this picture at least the two of you are pretty damn close so yeah I don't, don't want to say much to you yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. But, uh, that's that's the maniac dressed as boy George so he was uh <laughs> Uh, about a long time ago. <laughs> oh God! But uh, it's just it's it's fun walking over these now. Before we and I want to talk about the Sports Hall of Fame briefly, but before we go any further, I want to make sure that this is down for the record, because what has to rank as the single greatest stunt event promotion, whatever, in the years of University of Miami baseball that I was around, was the wedding of the Miami. <laughs> Maniac. This was the the Mark Light Cathedral Invitation Sunday, March twenty fourth, nineteen eighty five. So, who thought of this? I mean, uh, come on, so, so there had to be something behind this. Well, you know, several people had suggested it prior, but it, it just uh, yeah, Maniac getting married, nah. 
But there was an event uh, on campus in early uh, March of that year, about three weeks before the, the actual of wedding. Uh, it was called Carney Gras, and it was kind of in conjunction with Mardi Gras, but it was a carnival on campus. And all the fraternities and sororities set up booths and they, you know, charge you a, a dollar to get a hug with a girl or, you know, different things. And one of the booths was the guy would put on the wedding dress, the girl would put on a tuxedo and get your Polaroid picture back in the day when you had the Polaroid. And so I was there with Kevin Ryan and his girlfriend at the time, Nancy. Kevin was one of our pitchers. And Kevin convinced me, and he, uh, Nancy had one of her friends that was uh, my date for the evening. And um, Kevin convinced me to be the bridesmaid in this thing. So I'm standing there with a little veil on my head next to Kevin, who's got the full wedding thing out on and she's got a tuxedo and the other one has a tuxedo and nancy looks over and goes oh wouldn't it be cute if the maniac got married and kevin goes yeah the ibis could be his best man and then i said oh and we'll do that and it just kind of started <laughs> so and there it is rick- yeah there it is so monday morning i come into rick remmerd and we start discussing it he's like wow in three weeks we got this Sunday night nationally televised game against Maine. We'll get the black bear down. We'll get at the time I was actually making appearances at highly a racetrack as Freddie, the flamingo, you see the wonderful pink thing in the middle, but for the wedding, we called her. My God, that's an ugly flamingo. flamingo. Holy God. (laughs) And so the whole thing snowballed. So Rick, of course, Rick Remmert got in touch with ESPN and said, we've got this idea for something on Sunday night against Maine. It's going to be three, maybe four minutes. We'll get the characters out there. J. Rowe will read this speech. J. Rowe was the right on Reverend Rabbi Rokich. <laughs> and there he is in the background, yeah. Uh, yes, and, and so we had Bud Man, and we had the WIOD uh, Sports Hound. Uh, we actually had a couple of the ones on the, the left side there were fans who created their own characters. Uh, and so we allowed them out on the field. Yeah, see, I was going to say uh, something. And- I didn't want to say it to because that's the worst looking Ibis I've ever seen in my life. I mean, that's- well, that that actually that was my roommate uh, Bob Watson, and he didn't fit into the costume very well. Okay, was- so we'll see. There it is, and the mouth so- just looks like the mouth looks like I'm going to kill something. It looks looks like <laughs> Jaws for crying yeah, out loud. I think he had his head up and the you know with the, <laughs> the, the beak open. But uh, so we told ESPN it was going to be this three, four minute thing. They agreed to do it live. We would come back from a commercial. They'd mm-hmm. show it. Then they'd go to. We did this middle of the game in the top of the fourth inning. Dan Davies was pitching that night had only given up, I think, one hit. Uh, we were we were lit winning one to nothing. Uh, the 85 guys still give me a hard time about this. We had a 24 game winning streak. The school record was 26 games. Oh, we ended up I, losing this game. I know where this is. They going. give me grief for it, but Dan Davies still had the lead in the sixth inning, and we were done with all the wedding stuff. But so we do this this skit, and it took thirteen and a half minutes. ESPN covered the whole thing. It was hilarious. We had an antique car that drove Mrs. Maniac. She was already named Mrs. Maniac from <laughs> center field, but of course the maniac had to enter last, not the bride. The maniac did carried on the shoulders of the Batgirls. And then once the wedding was performed, the Batgirls had a, an arch with baseballs leading out to center field. It was just amazing. We had a Sunday night game. We'd, we'd normally have 1,500, 2,000 people. We had 3,500 people. We, we almost sold it out that night. Some people actually came, a couple of people came in tuxedos for, for the game. Uh, it was just an amazing thing. That summer, I'm doing a minor league baseball game in Kenai, Alaska. A, a college league game and there's a girl in the stands. And of course the maniac, like I say, would kind of occasionally go up and put his arm around a girl. This kid from three rows back goes, Hey maniac, I saw your wedding. I'm going to tell your wife. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm in Kenai, Alaska, but that shows you the power of the television power, and college. Sports. Not only of ESPN, but of university of Miami baseball in the eighties. That right. was, that, that but was the we were, power of that program. Kids in Kenai, Alaska, were watching Hurricane Baseball and watched the Maniac Wedding that night. Okay, I've never asked before. Who was Mrs. Maniac? 
Kevin's girlfriend, Nancy. So as I tell people, uh, yeah, it's kind of sad. The maniac got married, but his wife went home with one of the pitchers. But then that's... So in other words, it was just like real life Major League Baseball. (laughs) Yes. yes. (laughs) But it was was Nancy's idea, so we wanted to have her involved. Uh, We did have... uh, uh, we did a couple of other appearances with Mrs. Maniac over the in the 85 season. And then in, in 86, we created Maniac dolls to sell. So we decided to have a Maniac birth and the babies were delivered, of course, by Domino's, who was our big sponsor at the time. <laughs> and so we, we retired Mrs. Maniac to raise the children. And of course, immediately you can buy your uh, maniac dolls at uh, all sports across the street. Um, but uh, so, uh, but yeah, the, the maniac wedding to this day, I mean, more than almost 40 years later, people still, it's, it's the number one thing that, that people talk about. And uh, it was just, uh, it was a crazy time that, uh, you know, again, one of those things that doing it in the middle of a game, you, you couldn't just do that anywhere. You I could only do it at the light. So many great memories. I mean, it was, as I said, it was one of the greatest times of my broadcast career and my professional life, just being around that ballpark and, and around all those people and those, those wonderful games. And here we are so many years later, and I look back and I almost wish that we had those times back again in baseball in general, because John, it just doesn't seem as if college baseball gets a tremendous amount of attention anymore. It still seems at many times to be the sport that people forget And there's a camaraderie in baseball that is so special. I've only seen it with one other sport. I've seen it in ice hockey because a lot of the players grow up together and they're all together as kids and they all play on the rinks together. And, but back then baseball was sort of like that where everybody, and not everybody got along. Sure. Come on. You know, there were little things on the team that's, but it's, it's missing John. It's, it's, I, I, I'm going to put my old guy hat on here a little bit again, and I wish that we could not go back to those days, but recapture and still be able to have great college baseball and watch more of it. Because to me, it's still one of the great pure sports, even though I hate the ding of the metal bat. But (laughs) it's, uh, you know, I, I, I wish we could, we could go back to that. Do you, do you miss, I mean, it's a trite question. I know a lot of interviewers ask, but come on, you got to miss it. I mean, you, I know it's been a long time, but you still want to jump in the, you still want to jump in the, the the uniform if you could, though you might pull an ankle here and there. Uh, you know? With with my bad knees, I don't think I could last more than an inning or two. But no, you're right. It, it was just such a sweet and innocent so time. And uh, you know, I go to the ball games, all the all the ball games, sit with the Frazier family right behind home plate, and it's just not the same. You know, we the fans try to make it the same. But, you know, it just it, – it, it's different. And, you know, the players – you know, back in back in Coach Frazier's days, the players were just as as accessible as he was. You know, they, they would not just sign autographs, yes. but they'd hang out with the ball with, – with the fans. They would, you know, and, and thank them for being there. And, and you know, there was – it was just, uh, you know, a, a little more of an innocence, so to speak. And, and, and I realized that, you know, there's a lot more money and now you've got insurance – reasons you can't get kids on the field and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it's just, uh, it was just such a, a, a sweet and innocent time. And, and I, I thank God that I was, you know, part of it that can't, like I say, that where the stars all just came together and aligned just perfectly at that little ballpark on the corner of Santa Maro and Ponce de Leon. And, and when I look at, when I go to the ballpark today, it's so different, of course, but I wanted to tell you that uh, not long ago, well, it's been a while now, I think I still have some actual play-by-play tapes of those of that 83, 84, 85 seasons that I was there. I know I have some baseball tapes that were there, some VHS. And I promise you, when I get to the point of taking that garage over there and putting a blowtorch to it, before I do that, I will get those tapes. And if the Hall of Fame wants them, I will give them to you. Well, as I tell everyone, don't throw anything away. Give us the option to throw it away. We would love those tapes. We've we've had the conversations with the university about getting a lot of these things. We do have some tapes, uh, and you know, football. We uh, we certainly have a lot of love VHS VHS oh, yeah. tapes, but getting those digitized because it is our history, 
Uh, and so, you know, you never know what you have in a closet. So we tell everybody, yes, we would love them. Uh, the hall of fame is, is a, you know, a wonderful, uh, sometimes it feels like a dumping ground that people, but, but I'd rather them dump it with us and let us decide whether or not to throw it away. Than, well, I mean, than, I gotta, than I gotta tell you well, the time I've been down there and <laughs> I, I want to stop myself because John has more stuff than anybody I've ever seen in that Hall of Fame. It is incredible to walk through there. And I've been through a lot of major college halls of fame before. And they're set up a little bit differently. But my God, John, you've got boxes you haven't opened yet. I mean, I've seen albums in there you have you haven't looked at yet. And I think people need to understand that it's a history that needs to be preserved because Miami's history is unique more than any other, especially when you talk about the fact that they almost got, they did get rid of basketball, they almost got rid of football, almost got rid of baseball. And imagine what we would be like today without that involved in the sports conversation. I mean, I, it's still got to surprise you every now and then when you get something. I, I can still see John Ruth. Oh, holy crap. Look at this. You see, oh, wow. Are you still a little bit in awe when you see some of this stuff? I, yeah, I, I still, uh, I mean, I, like I say, I am kind of a pack rat at heart and I can't get, get rid of anything, but, but I guess as curator of the hall of fame, that's what it's all about is, is you, you, you know, I'm collecting the history and we we've got so much stuff. I, I am actually kind of going through an inventory right now of everything we have in, in our storage area. And, and, you know, we've got silent auction items. We'll, we'll be putting up, uh, uh, websites. Uh, actually you can go to um sports hall of fame.com, uh, and, and look at some of the link to, to some of the things that we will be selling because yeah, but it's just, I mean, every time I find I find something new every day I'm here, and and it, to me as a just loving history and and loving the University of Miami, it's it's fun to find these old things. You know, some of our our uh, uh, Hall of Famers will will send a box of stuff, and it's wow, where, you know, there's a jersey or a hat or uh, you know, it's just it's it's neat to 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 see all the, the old things, but. That's what we're here for. The Hall of Fame is, is um, you know, I'm open. We're open 12 to 5 weekdays. Uh, we were closed pretty much, obviously, during during COVID. But, uh, you know, people can come in and take a look around. And, and uh, it's just, it, it is neat. You know, you, you're right. People, you know, they think of, oh, Miami sports started in 1983 with the, the Ch national championship. Yeah, so much more. You know, Ted, Ted Hendricks, J Don Bossler, Jim Otto, Greg Luganis, Diver, um, you know, Patty Rizzo, golfer, uh, Doris Hart and Gardner Malloy, two of the greatest tennis players of the 40s and 50s. Um, you know, uh, we just have so much so much of a rich history that it's not just, uh, you know, football and and, and baseball. Uh, it's it, it's it's everything. So well, here's what we need to do. Miami, we, we need to get well, these Miami is famous. the first school to give away a female scholarship. People don't know that the very first school in the country. We need to so get yeah. some of these legendary athletes together in this format right here. And because we can do it through our production unit here and get and get them all on, get them all up, get three or four of them up at the same time and just tell stories. That'd I mean, be awesome. just ju just tell amazing stories. That's all it's about. Yeah. We are uh, we're going to do this again. But I got to say, this is this has been I do these shows for fun. And um, because nobody pays me yet. And please, God, I wish you would. Um, it's what we do it for, but this is, this has truly been one of, one of the, the, the true fun moments to do this. And I want to make sure that, that everybody hears what John says, because for those of you who are University of Miami fans, faithful followers, whatever, dating back wherever you are, uh, on the, on the calendar or across the planet, the, the sports hall of fame has the memorabilia here. And it's a great place to donate your stuff to, to give it to them, to let them have it. To, to, to be here and to to continue to, to hold that history tight. Now, you can get a hold of John. You can go to Twitter, UM Sports Hall of Fame. On Facebook, it's U-M-S-H-O-F. Okay, there you go. Very nice, John. Very nice. It's good to see. And uh, if you want to email John and find out what he's looking for and what you may have, John is only one of 17 people in America who still has an AOL address. I'm one, so that's we're two of two of seventeen. You got you got the big shot here. Uh, that's UM Sports Hall of Fame at AOL.com. Make sure you send him something there. John, it has been a pleasure, my friend. 
Um, I'm going to see you again soon. Uh, as soon as Nelson gets back to me, we're going to get to a ball game one time, and I'm going to ask him to flex again. That could be frightening and could cost millions of lives. <laughs> But uh, and I've enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to having another beer with you, buddy. We're we're gonna we we need to after what this planet has been through in the last five or six years, we need lots of beers. We need more beers than we ever had before. Take care of yourself, my I'll friend. Stock up Always, the Hall of Fame kitchen. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything. You did. I just <laughs> I I wasn't going to say anything about the secret refrigerator, John. But okay, now that you did, it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, buddy. John Roof from the University of Miami Sports Hall of Fame. Don't forget, you can watch the show and share it with your friends by going to welcometothearena.com. That's the YouTube version, which, of course, you can URL, share it anywhere. Also, don't forget, we're on podcasts. Go to all the major podcast platforms. Search out Ed Berliner, the man in the arena. You'll find the shows there. Listen to them. And again, be part of the University of Miami and other universities. Hold that heritage tight because it what. Those memories are the best things we have. Thanks to John Ruth. Thanks to the entire University of Miami baseball program over the years for being one of the biggest parts of my life. For everybody here, I'm Ed Berliner. Rock on, true believers. See ya! You're still here? Are you not entertained? It's over. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, Let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Go home. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Go! That's all, folks.